This is technology, isn't it? Fortunately, you're going sailing. <laughs> sailing and technology do not often go well together. <laughs> Just while we're finding the slides. Good morning to you. It's lovely to see you all. I'm Roger. I'm from the Humble School of Yachting. And as uh, was said, Jeremy, it's probably I'm not an average, but probably a typical instructor. <laughs> and my aim this morning is really to try and give you an idea of self-reliance and talk about that more than anything else. Thank you. Although that says uh, training for offshore passages, I'd rather call it how to make tea. <laughs> This is important to me, and my whole life revolves around making tea. Wherever you are, then that's important. And I'm focusing more on that than just the training for an offshore passage. It's some of the skills you might require and looking like that. I mean, I've had the privilege or the experience of doing the arc. Um, I've done a lot of ocean passages, and I love it. Unfortunately, I've sailed into the sunset too many times, and although I'm a member of the Flat Earth Society, I keep coming back. And I think that's probably because I get the planes back and I haven't been all the way around yet. But it doesn't matter whether it's a long passage or a short <coughs> passage, the skills still remain the same. Um, and that's really what I'm going to look at and concentrate on the sort of training side of it this morning. So, I mean, really, why, why have you come here? Why do you think you might need more training? Anybody, any ideas? What's your priority when you're out there? Safety. Safety. Oh, thank you so much. That's on my slide. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you a cup of tea later, honestly. <laughs> and obviously that's people's priority there, is they want to be safer. And being safe is... A, state of mind, isn't it? You're thinking of the what-ifs and just being that little bit more careful. So when you're on the ocean, if something doesn't go quite right, um, as Jeremy said, you don't have instant help. So even sort of tripping over and banging your knee, have you got that aspirin? You know, it's that sort of thing you need to make sure that you've thought about before you go. And then we can go on and on and on about safety. The other thing about safety is, how big's your wallet? <laughs> Have you got several credit cards? You can't, you can improve your safety, but you can't buy safety. It's you looking after yourselves, isn't it? That's far more important. You can invest in millions of pounds of electronics, but if you fall over and you haven't got a life jacket on, it's not a lot of good really, is it? So it's that state of mind, and that's when I talk about safety, I think that's really important that you think about your welfare and not just the budget. I am going to encourage you to spend some more money on things that I might think are useful. And this comes back to the self-reliance. <coughs> and again, it comes back to buying your everyday things. In the ocean, if I run out of tea, where am I going to get it? You may not think this is a serious issue. To me, it is. I might have be growing some cress or tomato plants on the back of the boat, but it's unlikely I'm going to have a tea plant. But thinking about those potty plants and the tomatoes, it's going to be, give me some fresh food, isn't it? You have no idea of the joy after 30 days of actually having a nice, ripe tomato that's not frozen or anything like that. And then you can share it with your crew if they need to it. So that's the sort of self-reliance I'm looking at there. And again, if I'm talking about my tea, boiling water, I like my tea with boiling water. The sun's hot, isn't it? So I could sit there with a magnifying glass, isn't it, and warm a little bit. Or perhaps have a solar cooker or something like that. Because if you've got an electric cooker, electricity and water don't mix, do they? Gas. Did you put that spare bottle on board? Did you check that it was full? Have you got spares for your cooker? All of those sort of things. It's all those little bits, the what-ifs, 
And it's not the major disasters, it's the little ones, isn't it? I mean, those of you who are lucky enough to have a boat, do you have a freezer on board? And how much does it contain in the freezer? Not a lot. Well, that's probably a good thing, actually, because if it fails, those of us who are meat eaters can only eat steak for so much. You know, you can have the steak that thick for breakfast, but after the 24 hours, it gets a bit boring, doesn't it? So you've got to think of your alternatives and bits and pieces like that. And it also comes down to the spares on board your boat. And again, how many of you have got electric heads? Oh, that's a relief. How many of you got a bucket on board? Excellent! So it's thinking of all those little bits and pieces that I'm really quite keen on. And again, what I'm here is to try to encourage you to improve your current skills. Some of you may be ocean racers. That's great. I bet you know a lot about that port winch. Or a little bit about sail trim or something like that. But it's involving everybody, isn't it? So everybody knows how to cook. Can you all cook? Are you sure? Or is that something somebody else does? Or it comes from the takeaway? Again, that's another thing. There are not many takeaways in the middle of nowhere, are there? So you've got to think of things like that as well. And if you've thought about it, then it's going to increase your enjoyment. And that's what I'm about here. You've been inspired, you know, sailing across the Atlantic. You're going to these palm line beaches. <coughs> Fantastic. Actually, I prefer coming back. Not because I'm coming back to the cold, but it's different. The Azores, amazing. So it's all to do with that enjoyment. And that's what I'm here for, really, and to encourage you. This is a bit of doom and gloom, really. So you've got your yacht, you're all prepared, but things still go wrong. And what's the main reason that things go wrong? Anybody take a guess at that? Absolutely. We're not perfect, are we? And we know it's the machine's fault. But often, you know, little human error and things like that, we get tired, we make mistakes. And again, this is the classic, I'm not sure how well you can see that at the back. This was a little mishap that one of the clipper boats had. It sort of hit a reef and it sort of stopped there for a while. Now the human error in that case was you can, I'm not apportioning blame in any way, shape or form, but probably most of you are going to navigate using electronics, aren't you? You're foolhardy if you don't, to be quite honest. You've got all, all the backups and everything else. But when you're approaching the shore, that's when life gets difficult. If you're sailing for weeks on end, you don't see very much. And then you see the beautiful island coming towards you. And it's approaching very quickly. And you don't have time to think you have to speed the process up. So little mistakes can be made. So think ahead. And yeah, it was unfortunate it hit the bottom. But they all survived, which is good. And they were, I was going to call them not amateurs, but they were pleasure sailors. They're perhaps you'd like you or I who want to <coughs> sail and enjoy it and gain an experience. These were the professional guys. These are the top class racers. These are the Formula One racers. They still make mistakes too. But why am I putting that up there? It's not because of the doom and gloom, but nobody died. And although you've got the human factor, what's important there is the training and the procedures that go with it. If your accident happens, can you overcome that little problem? You know, whether it's something simple like the head's failing or it's a catastrophic failure like that, have you thought about it? Have you practiced it? Then you're going to get better and it will all work wonderfully well and you will survive. So it's good training and well rehearsed routines. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Has anybody grounded their yacht yet? Thank goodness for that. Somebody's honest. If you haven't, you will. Please stay away from the rocks. They hurt. 
Well, actually, I come from Cornwall, and it's a bit like the East Coast. Sometimes we're lucky to be afloat there. You know that Paul woman went under the chain ferry. Now it was all that news. There were ferries going sideways in the channel. The tide was going out like something before. Now it's lapsing on the sand. <laughs> for about five hours. Sorry, I shouldn't <laughs> laugh, but it's, uh, it adds to the <laughs> doesn't it? <laughs> but it's, I mean, little things go wrong. And again, you know, thinking about it and being prepared, you can overcome it. And then you can laugh and joke about it. And hopefully they bought you dinner on the estate. Bacon sandwiches, 45 degrees. <laughs> <laughs> That's an experience in itself, yeah. isn't it? That's it. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> So that's the sort of thing I'm looking at. This is, if you've thought about it, unfortunately a bit more doom and gloom. This was a nice little yacht, really nice people, very well prepared yacht. And they were sailing along quite happily in the sunshine and approaching St. Lucia, not too far away, a few hundred miles or something, and a mast fell down. Now that can really upset your day, can't it? <laughs> And you're really looking forward to that rum punch. But that's, it's an inconvenience. And we could talk about all the expenses and things you can buy and all the rest and bits and pieces. But if it does fall down, you solve the problem. In my case, I'd have a cup of tea at that point. In fact, I'd probably have several cups of tea. But they managed to solve the problem very well. They'd thought about it. They used the materials on board the boat. It's rather a sort of Victorian approach in some ways. You've got the materials, you've got your tool <coughs> kits, you've got your sewing needle. Kids are very good at inspirational because they go to primary school, don't they? And they play with sand and water and buckets and things. So they often come up with some inspirational ideas to help you solve the problems. And of course, by the time they come teenagers, they're useless because they can't get Google to solve the problem out there. But it's that sort of thing of just thinking about it and <coughs> getting it. But again, the crucial thing here was they thought about it, they came up with a solution, and they continued on their way. Again, this well-rehearsed routines, and they were fine. It actually didn't slow them down that much. They actually did six and a half knots over the finishing line with that jury rig. Yes! <laughs> Sorry, we be careful with these things, haven't we? But imagine the enjoyment and the satisfaction of doing that at the end. Yeah, it's the sort of thing <coughs> a new master is not so I good. I was just thinking that excitement soon wears off when you get the bill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it all sort of enhances what you're doing. But yeah, the bill is not good. <laughs> yeah, getting a new mast is sometimes difficult. But even then, you might be able to modify it depending on where you are. I don't think palm trees make very good masts, but you never know, do you? So I'm very keen on that and looking at that sort of thing. So you need to think about equipment failure and those sort of bits and pieces. So look at the possibilities of what you can do on your boat. All boats are very different. So there's no simple solution. Yours is the best boat in the whole wide world. And in your eyes, it's probably the most beautiful boat as well. The other things that you sort of really need to consider is rudders and things <coughs> like that, isn't it? If your rudder falls off or you have little mishaps with it, you've got to do something about it. Has anybody had steering failure yet? God, you're all remarkably good. Yay! Was it serious or just a, one of those irritations? An irritation. How did you solve the problems, sir? Fortunately, the shouted at us. I'm speechless. Excellent. That may not be an option on your own boat. <laughs> Not great. You did one, but again, you solved the solution. Even if it's calling the charter firm, you can have a sat phone on the boat, aren't you? 
Well, at least you can talk to somebody, can't you? So again, it's just thinking like that and thinking ahead and thinking of those possibilities. And actually sort of mentioning that the amount of debris, unfortunately, in the ocean is quite considerable. So it's quite possible you'll get something wrapped around it. Propeller, don't go swimming in rough seas. It's not recommended. In fact, it's generally not considered worth swimming in cold waters. But some of you are going to go somewhere warm. So on a flat, calm day, go swimming in the middle of the ocean. You don't have to have something wrapped around your rudder, honestly. But just go for a swim. It will be an experience you will never forget. Once. Once. Oh, you, yeah, if you're brave, you might do it twice. But no, it's just wonderful. You've got to fill in those days sometimes. Don't watch Jaws the day before. <laughs> but if your rudder does go wrong or something goes, you might be able to solve it with an emergency tiller that you'll all have fitted and played with and things like that. Of course you will have by then. But you've got to think about creating maybe a, a steering or, or something like that. It could take you days to create something. You need a full workshop there. Electric drills, planes, drawings, all kinds of things maybe. But it does depend on your boat. Using steering oars on larger boats, on large modern boats, it's not always the solution. It might be on your boat, because each boat's different. You might have already thought of it and had a hydrovane or a self-steering gear that might supplement it. The best thing is actually normally, if there's still your rudder there, if you're steering, is to use the autopilot, isn't it? And that doesn't mean the manual one, that means the electric one. I don't like mentioning that. But what I prefer is to use um, drogues and things like that if your steering goes wrong. It's just personal preference and again, sort of boats. All it means is you can get some very expensive ones and you can get some ultra expensive ones. And in days gone by, you would go along and buy a bunch of used car tires and drag them out the back. It's something that's gonna cause drag in the water. And if you move that drag from side to side, you'll be able to steer the boat quite successfully. So just some thoughts and ideas of what you can do. And again, there will be lots of people around um, over this weekend that you can talk to that have used them perhaps, not necessarily in anger, but an experience on their different types of boat, whether it's you know creating an alternative um, rudder or using drogues and things like that. All those experiences are here, so do ask those questions. Uh, and it can be quite fun. I mean, we, we were actually, yes, I'm not going to go into that now. We were sailing during the week and we were playing things like that. Nothing had gone wrong, just for fun. But what my emphasis here really on is keeping things simple. Modern boats are incredibly sophisticated. In fact, nobody knows how they work. Because if you want a new boat and you want the top of the range, you are having state-of-the-art software, everything else, specially made for you. It hasn't been tried and tested. So inevitably, it may not function as well as you had hoped. So think of the Victorian solutions to things, and it makes life a lot better. We do like keeping things simple. And with keeping things simple there, if you're looking at it, you've got to keep the water out, haven't you? You remember the Dutchman? We picked on the Germans, now we can pick on the Dutch. They put their fingers in the dike, didn't they? We have modern alternatives to that, but whatever it might be, you've got to think about that. You've got to think about your bilge pumps, things like that. Because your boat is your home, you don't want ingress of water, do you? And probably if you brought a production boat, the bilge pumps are purely to get rid of the condensation in the bottom of the boat. You've got to keep the crew on the boat, haven't you? We can talk a lot about life jackets, but we really don't want them to fall off. Even if they've been bad tempered and not very cooperative, it's better to arrive with the same number of people as you set off with. So think very carefully of how you're going to keep the people on the boat. So again, it's setting the guidelines of when you're going to be clipped on, when it's safe, when it's not safe. 
and you're going to be very draconian imposing those rules. People don't fall off when, often fall off when it's rough. Something else has probably gone wrong. It's a nice sunny day like today. Just sitting down, nice warm sunshine. Leap up into the air because somebody asks you to do something and you feel a bit dizzy and you fall splat. So it's those. You just need that little bit more attention sometime. Keep them on board. Yeah, unless it's calm, of course, then you throw the children off because they need to swim. And again, there's been a lot of talk about keels and things like that. On our cruising boats, generally, keels do not fall off. They don't have a reputation of falling off. So again, if your boat has been properly maintained, serviced, and it's been checked, and I always advise people before any long passage, is to put a diver down or lift the boat, have a good look at it, because I say there's a lot of debris out there, you don't know what it's. Don't go swimming in the harbours in the Canaries, that won't improve your health at all. But, you know, if you're in your tropical island, it's perfectly clean just to go around and have a look. Not everything is doom and destruction. <coughs> keep the keel down. The other one, keep the mast up. <laughs> a boat without a mast is so uncomfortable. The motion is disgusting. And anyway, you have to use that engine then, which is terrible. So we don't like using engines much. Sometimes you have to. And keep the rudder on. So again, all of this emphasis is look at the bigger picture. Just don't concentrate on, I'm going to die. You're not. It's being able to make your everyday things more pleasant than they would be, even if you have a little hiccup. And the rest of the stuff is tiny, really. You don't have to worry too much about it, apart from the tea, of course. Or if you've got a coffee, of course, and you like coffee machines, have you got spares for that coffee machine? Because <coughs> you probably won't get them outside of the country you bought your coffee machine in. And if it runs off electric, then you might even have to have a hand generator or something to create your coffee. Because that improves your life, doesn't it? <coughs> your preparation. Have a location plan for all your bits and pieces that you've got on board the boat. Make sure everybody knows where everything is. So what I like is where you have those beautiful pictures of your boat, in the sunshine, in the tropical, remove that for your passage and stick a laminate up. So a nice colour-coded laminate of all the bits and pieces, so where the safety gear is, all those sort of bits and pieces there. So, I, again, you won't be able to read or see the colours at the back, I'm afraid. But all the fire, or sorry, all the first aid is labelled green. Of course, you can see the colours in the dark, so you always have a torch in your pocket, don't you? And fire is blue, and all the through holes are red. It's not compulsory you use those colours, but it means that everybody knows where all the key things are and then you can locate them and it saves the crew waking you up at four o'clock in the morning asking where something is. So again, for your comfort is if everybody knows how everything operates, it's much better, isn't it? So just things like that. I'm very, very keen on those sort of laminates and bits and pieces like that. I'm also very keen on keeping maintenance records. I can't write very well, so I get the crew to do that. And maybe even draw little pictures and things. But keeping a good record of all the maintenance that you've done on the boat makes a, keeps a good record. So you know if there's something persistently failing or not performing well, then you're going to carry enough spares and bits and pieces for it <coughs> to be able to cover that sort of side of it. And it's that attention to detail as well is going to be a lot better. And is going to make you much, much happier with that. Again, I can go on and on for hours about that, but I won't. But I like laminated cars. Did anybody get a laminator for Christmas? They're really quite fun. Once you start, you can't stop. Yeah, it's perfect, isn't it? And if you've got kids with you, they just love it. 
because they know how to resize things as well, because they're good on the computer, I'm not. But you can set up laminate cards for your procedures, whatever it might be, and you can store them so they're active and you can hand them around. So you can detail jobs to the crew, so they've each got individual responsibilities. So it's looking at your expertise of your crew, isn't it? It's very useful to have an electrical electronics engineer that's not a programmer, but actually can, knows how to fix things. It's useful. It might be useful to have an engineer as well, a plumbing expert. All those sort of things are vitally important to your well-being. And who's the most important person on board the boat? The cook. If you don't eat well, you're unhappy. So taking a chef, or perhaps sending some, one of your crew on a chef's course might be very useful. Actually, you're all going to take turns. Treats have become wonderful. So although I've got to talking about man overboard and all those sort of things, thinking about your personal welfare is as important as anything else. All I'm stressing there is routines are important, that everybody has their responsibility. You take it in turns. Everybody knows how to use all the safety equipment. You've practiced all your drills, all the bits and pieces that go with it. And then it makes it much more fun. And they actually enjoy it. The worst case scenario is where the skipper knows everything and doesn't delegate. They get tired, they get grumpy, they get bad tempered, and their credit bill goes up. So if everybody's involved, it enhances your enjoyment. And again, perhaps it's worthwhile while we're here, is when you're looking at the boats, you've all seen the rules and regulations regarding safety when we're looking through the boats, is have a stroll through and see where people keep things. It's not the detail that you should have this many flares, but where do you keep them? Can you actually use them? What are they for? That sort of thing. Crew preparation. I like this picture a lot. You spent a lot of time there. They've got all the bits and pieces on the table. That's fantastic. But getting your crew involved early, friends, relatives, whatever it might be, it becomes a family event. And again, having very clear rules on safety. You know, personal safety. It includes boiling the kettle for making my tea. You know, if it's rough, or something like that, even in the tropics, it's better to think about some boots and leggings and things like that. It's that prevention and those sort of bits and pieces. Again, I just happen to be there, boring some more people with some more details about the navigation. Navigation's simple, isn't it? But again, everybody needs to, on the boat needs to have an overall idea of the plan. So if your preferred navigator decided they'd had enough, somebody else can take over. Electronics does make it easier, but again, paper is still good, particularly for your pilotage plans and bits and pieces like that. Um, it, it just doesn't work using your plotter as a Game Boy driving into the harbour. You've still got to go between those red and green posts, and if it's a rock in front of you, it ain't going to move. Even if the plotter says it's not there, it's there, don't hit it. Hold a thorough safety brief with your crew. And I don't mean on the day of departure. You know, this should be thought about long term, weeks, months in advance. What you should always do with the safety brief is make your own. You can create lists that, you know, can become a book and they're meaningless. It's the key things. Personal safeties, if I have to abandon ship, does everybody know how to operate the life raft? Do they know what's in the grab bag? Do they know what to take? Where's your credit card? Passport comes in useful as well. Those are the important things. These days, you're not going to be sitting, if you're lucky, in a life raft for very long. There's some wonderful books about people who spent months in them. You don't want to be that person. That's where the money comes in. A little e-perk works well, doesn't it? They'll come and get it. But think about it. And before you depart, always do a man overboard practice. It's not so much the crew don't know, but it reminds them what rope does what, really, and can they still drive the boat. Get out there and practice. 
we'll look or show you some things how to get people back on board. Getting back to the person is relatively easy, with or without the use of electronics. What's far more difficult is actually lifting them back on board. So we've got some wonderful things we can show you here today as well. Um, so we can show you that. I'll start by just showing you some bits and pieces and then there's some other alternatives that Bill at the back there will show you as well, which might make your life a lot, lot easier. But the start is just a halyard, isn't it? Procedure to abandon ship. It sounds terrific, doesn't it? So if you do abandon ship, what do you think is the most important thing? Order. Sorry? Order. Order. Yeah, Organised chaos, isn't it? But that's where the practice comes in. It's launching your life raft, isn't it? You can talk about a million and one other things you can do, grabbing your grab bag, doing this, doing that. <coughs> the DSC button is actually very useful. Tell everybody else you've got a problem. But most of your safety equipment is going to be what you've got in the pockets if it's that bad. And having an organised, big organised, I like that very much actually. So you've got your locker, you've got the bits and pieces, you know where everything is, everybody knows it there. I put that up as the prime example. You know what's going to happen to that locker, don't you? It's, oh, yes, exactly. It's all the other little bits and pieces that go on top of it, doesn't it? Don't do it. Uh, again, practice fire and that. Mouse may sound daft, but actually carry out a fire routine. If you really don't like your crew, just as they're going to bed, shout fire. That will be your organised chaos then. But it's important because think of your escape hatches, the way that you exit the boat. You may say, oh yeah, I can just pop out through the fore hatch. Have you actually tried it on a large boat? You often need a lift to get up to it. Or there's a spinnaker pole or a dinghy or something ac across the top of it. So actually, if you've practiced it, you'll have a much better idea of what works and what doesn't work. You've got emergency steering, use it. Nice sunny day like today, go and play with it. People will laugh at you out there, but it's good fun. Again, and you can create things. I just love the pictures of what people get up to. On long passages, you can be very bored sometimes. So have fun with it. And one of the things that I, I'm rather keen on as well, that I haven't plugged that much, is if you do break down and you require a tow, you're going to have to secure a tow line, aren't you? Think about it. Have you got a Samson post? You're going to have to create a bi bridle. You might be towed for some considerable distance. It's not like pottering around here, is it? Sea start is fantastic and they just throw a line on and drag you back into the harbour. It's got to be something pretty substantial, hasn't it? So think about those sort of things. Storm sills, we can go on forever, but it's a nice day, so I'm going to skip that. It's never windy out there, is it? You're never going to be in a storm, are you? Just practice putting the things up and down on a nice day. You know, four, four five, perfect. It's amazing how well the boat sails. What we can offer you um, is a sort of introduction. There are various courses and things, and I'm just going to run through these incredibly quickly. But the fundamental is, if you're sailing offshore, the ISAF one day just covers all the bits and pieces. You set off some flares, try not to kill one another. We talk about all the doom and destruction, lifting people, those sort of bits and pieces. Um, cutting rigging and things like that, well worthwhile having a thought. And it's perhaps as an individual or as a group of you, works well. Sea survival, everybody on board your boat should do a sea survival course. It will absolutely convince you never ever to enter a life raft. They're absolutely brilliant. And Tongue in cheek, they're a lot of fun, as long as you don't mind going in relatively cold water. Um, and they teach you all kinds of fun things, but the idea is to ensure that you know how your equipment works. And with life rafts, 
well, you're going to service your life raft, make sure that when your life raft is serviced, that you actually see what it looks like when it's inflated and the equipment that's got in it. So, you now have a look in it. If you're it's not due for servicing and you know the type of life raft you've got, have a look round at the boat shows and things like that. Well worthwhile. But no, I highly recommend doing a sea survival course. First aid. Mm. How many of you have done a first aid course? Absolutely brilliant. Oh, I like that. So, but again, when you're looking at first aid courses, looking at the level of experience on board your boat. If you've got a brain surgeon on board your boat, he's probably not the best first aid person. If you've got a paramedic, he probably is. But you're looking at your experience, the type of voyage you're on. Around here, you don't need too much. If you're 2,000 miles offshore, you need to think a little bit more seriously about it. And again, you've got to think of the size of vessel and the stowage. If I'm on a small boat, I'm not going to have the equipment of a small hospital that some of the larger vessels are going to have. So looking at that and the number of crew you've got. If there's only two of you and one of you dies, it's not a lot of point really, is there? So it's always subjective, that. So the sort of issues you're going to have are pretty obvious, aren't they? How many of you have tripped over or slipped on a rope? Yeah? Yeah. How many of you burnt your fingers? Yeah. How many of you cut yourself? Yeah. How many of you got something in your eye? Yeah. Those are the everyday things, aren't they? And that's terrific. And you're pretty good at that. And how many of you haven't been seasick yet? You haven't been seasick yet? Don't worry, you will be. <laughs> So you've got to look at all those sort of things like that. Um, and then the sort of normal bits and pieces. If you're just in short, and for the majority of us, just basic first aid courses are fantastic, aren't they? But if you're going offshore, it's certainly worth considering at least one member of the crew looking at some more advanced courses, unless you have some medics or nurses or things like that on board. And they sort of vary in length and complexity, really. The sort of MCASTCW ones, four days, that's quite a long time. But it goes into more advanced first aid. If you want to do even more, then the five or another five days, which actually is pretty intensive. You learn all kinds of medical procedures, I just get very squeamish at. But if you're doing, you know, the world arc or something, it would probably be beneficial for somebody to have some of that knowledge there. It's still not going to turn you into a brain surgeon, but it will teach you to use the equipment that you're likely to carry on board your boat. Um, now, some people love first aid. I suffer it, really. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. If that person's head's fallen off, you're not a lot you can do with them, really. So. Maintenance. This is a big one, actually, in the sense that you've got to learn the routine maintenance of your boat. And as Jeremy started with, there's not somebody out there who's going to do it for you. So learn how to service your winches. Learn the bits and pieces you need to repair them. Because if you service your winch for the first time, it's like anything. It's like little springs in it. They go ping, and they don't float. And it's very embarrassing if you haven't got a spare of them. I mean, with rigging and things like that, you're not going to become a rigging expert, but there will be rigging experts around over the weekend. Talk to them. They will tell you what to look for, and you'll be able to spot the obvious. Again, before a long passage, get a professional to have a look at it. They know what they're looking for. You know, if a shroud's broken, yeah, I can recognize that. But if I look at it, I can't see if it's about to break, unless it's fairly obvious. So professional advice is often a good thing. Engine servicing and generators, yeah. How many of you are mechanics? Brilliant, you're in your hev seventh heaven, aren't you? And you can talk about it. And all I do is take my car and it plugged into the workshop and it says, I'm not playing today, where's your credit card? Now it's exceeded the balance, it won't work. But the basic problems we can solve at sea remain the same, whatever engines you've got, whatever generator you've got. And the generator is probably more important than the engine. 
to keep your freezer working, keep your autopilot working. Pumps, things like that, impellers, generators, all the bits and pieces are terrific. Toolkits. Again, talk to people on the boats when you're going around talking to them, Dave, what, what they've actually invested in. And I'm sure you'll talk to some and say, oh, I spent thousands of pounds on it. So actually all I used was my little electric drill. So look at what is sensible for your boat and buy reasonable quality stuff. And it's their advice they can give you today is going to be far more important than what I can teach or stand up here and talk about. The only thing there with the electrics is have a good voltmeter. They're an incredible piece of kit. And you get flashing lights on them now and diagnostic tools and they cost very little. Uh, that sort of thing. Little bits of spare wire. Uh, very important, just make sure you've got all your manuals as well. And get to know every nook and cranny of your boat. It's just incredible. Still find things on some boats. So we can offer seven days maintenance courses and all the rest of it, but it covers all the eventualities. We don't run them very often, so if you're interested, you know, please talk to us and we can arrange something. But the other thing, of course, is we can come along and give you advice on your boat. Um, I can say that, but there are so many people here this weekend take full advantage of their um, advice. We offer navigation courses. Probably most of you will have know enough um, coastal navigation already, but we offer ocean courses. We can teach you to use a sextant, which is great fun. It passes the time positively, and it's really good fun. You're still going to use your GPS, but it's great fun. <laughs> But mainly with that is we're talking about worldwide meteorology and things like that. Radar courses as well. If you don't know how to use your radar or you're just self-taught, find somebody who knows how to use a radar. It's a wonderful tool out there. And it, you can include AIS, but it's basically for collision avoidance. You can identify the island you're about to hit. If it's on the radar, it's there. But again, you may not have radar on your boat because it's a small boat and they do use power. So those sort of things, but yeah, it's more than just switching it on and hoping for the best. Weather, again, highly important. Again, um, Jeremy's already said with the rallies and things like that, it's very carefully chosen. It's not just, oh, this is a nice place to go to, we'll go there tomorrow. There's a lot of thought goes into it, doesn't it? And it's ensuring as you said at the beginning, is being in the right place at the right time. And again, we run various courses, but our most uh, valuable course for us is run by Chris Tibbs, who's well known here, and he runs a fantastic course. He is the guy, and he's so unimposing, it's just incredible. And he actually goes sailing as well, which is just unheard of, so he actually does that and goes there and does it goes on. And again, of course, we'll be delighted to come and play on your boat. If you've got a nice boat, we particularly like it. If you've got an unusual boat, we particularly like it. Because it flo if it floats, we want to have a go. But that can be for preparation, it can be for anything. But mainly, have a fantastic adventure. And enjoy yourselves. I think that's the real thing there. I've got nothing else to say at this point. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. As I said earlier, keep